Hello, I'm Alan Mendeloff, a member of the Wisconsin HFMA chapter. Welcome to our video learning series for achieving the Certified Healthcare Financial Professional designation. As healthcare professionals, we work in a reform environment that requires entities to fundamentally rethink their business models. The new CHFP exam reflects this changing reality. Recent reforms prevent every health, present every healthcare organization with several fundamental challenges to combine financial analysis and business acumen to identify opportunities, to devise creative responses, to launch new solutions, and to sustain positive gains. The emphasis of HFMA's certification program is, to, is developing the skills needed to participate in shaping this business environment. Organizations must become learning organizations that continuously measure and understand the business environment, translate goals into actions, execute effectively, and evaluate results. Our industry needs people who can lead change in a fluid, in a fluid world. So the purpose of the CHFP program has shifted toward continuous learning, not just demonstrating expertise and experience. A critical business issue is the recruitment, development, and retention of competitive talent. The new CHFP program is intended both for individuals to use in advancing their careers and for organizations to use as a component of a talent development program. The new CHFP program includes two modules. The first is called the Business of Healthcare. This module's focus is on understanding the business environment from a financial perspective. Importantly, this module includes the business realities for payers and physicians, as well as hospital providers. A fundamental business assumption in building the module content is that CHFPs will work in a collaborative, multidisciplinary workplace resulting from the transformation from providing care to managing health. The second module is called Operational Excellence, focusing on specific payer, physician, and hospital provider concerns. It utilizes case studies to present candidates the opportunity to see, to see real-world business situations and test their ability to apply the knowledge gained in Module 1. This module encourages multidisciplinary thinking and appreciation of other professionals' business concerns. With these goals in mind, the chapters of Wisconsin, Connecticut, Arizona, and Vermont and New Hampshire have collaborated to bring you the following learning module. Today's speaker is Travis Boucher. Travis is the Director of Finance and Pol Reimbursement Policy with the New Hampshire Hospital Association. Prior to this role, he was the Associate Director of Revenue Cycle Operations at the Elliott Hospital and has a track record of collaborative success working on financial and operational initiatives. He is a graduate of the Health Management and Policy Program at the University of New Hampshire. He worked at LRGH Healthcare in Laconia before going to graduate school to receive his Master's in Business Administration with a focus in healthcare administration from Wagner College in New York. The topic to be presented today is Managing Financial Resources. Thank you for your time and investment in the CHFP certification program. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we're at the, the second to last course of our modules, the six courses. So by now, you have probably looked at uh, the big picture, financial accounting concepts, uh, cost analysis principles, strategic financial issues, and now we are at Managing Financial Resources. Uh, my name is Travis, uh, and I'm gonna walk you through some of uh, the basic concepts of managing financial resource. This is um, within module one, the business of healthcare, and course number five. Today's learning objectives are to describe how healthcare providers are reimbursed for services, Recognize the type of reimbursement methods used in the healthcare industry. Just describe the processes by which a hospital or physician clinic bills insurances. Calculate metrics used to manage the revenue cycle. Name resource management issues in healthcare, business, and lastly, recognize the methods that healthcare businesses finance receivables and account capital acquires capital equipment. So we're going to highlight key knowledge for strong performance 
and provide an overview of important concepts. The in-depth presentation is in the online course. So again, I'm just going to go over today um, basic concepts within revenue management, talk a little bit about revenue cycle, um, a little about payment, types of payment, um, and just do a, an overview of these concepts. And the online course um, for the certification will really get into the detail of um, you know, revenue cycle, healthcare finance. So let's talk a little about um, these concepts um, from high level, and I'm going to go through um, some basic concepts, but then I'm going to tie them in a little bit at the end on how they really fit into the revenue cycle. So I think it's important to touch on how they fit into the revenue cycle, what um, some really important concepts are. Uh, one being, you know, the patient portion or out-of-pocket payment. Uh, insur insurers generally require some out-of-pocket payment by the patient to supplement the insurance payment, usually as an incentive for the patient to use insurance only when needed. The types of out-of-pocket payments are deductible, co-insurance, and co-payment. The deductible is a predetermined amount that the patient pays before the insurer begins to pay for the services. The co-insurance is the percentage of insurance payment amount paid by the patient along with the amount paid by the insurer. A co-payment is a flat amount that the patient pays at each time of service. Uh, an example of copay is a $25 office visit, um, $25 that you pay when you visit your primary care provider or specialty office. Um, or it could be a hundred dollars, one hundred and fifty dollar copayment that you pay when you go to the ED. Now, of course, they vary among plans um, in your benefit plan, but uh, there's a lot of insurance plans that have copayments. So that's like an example of copayments. Also, prescription drugs typically have copayments, and they vary, you know, based on um, your your generic drug versus specialty drug. Uh, but it is important to remember that the patient is ultimately responsible for the payment of services to a physician or hospital. Uh, a contract between an insurer and a provider may limit the ability for the provider to collect from the patient uh, for denial of payment for covered services. However, uh, the patient may have to pay a provider for any services not determined to be covered benefit um, the patient um, contracts with the insurer. So paying physicians for hospital services. Uh, the term reimbursement is used to describe by an insurer to a hospital or physician. Uh, so it's the payment um, that the insurer essentially gives the hospital or the physician, and this is referred to as reimbursement. Uh, it's, it's termed this way because it's a uh, physician or hospital provider will render services to a patient and then submit a claim to an insurer for reimbursement. Uh, another concept um, I'm going to touch base on is AR. Uh, AR is the time span between submitting a claim and receiving payment. Uh, and it can re represent a challenge uh, for hospital or physician. Uh, the average time it takes for a physician to be paid, so the average time it takes, is known or measured by days in account receivable. So for example, 35 days in account receivable is a ratio, and it's the average payment that that provider um, or hospital uh, gets paid. And as this screen, that's just some um, nice little logos in terms of you know, AR, sign here, payment received. Uh, the physician or hospital has already, so it's important to note that the physician or hospital has already paid for the resources needed um, in providing the service to the patient, you know, such as the salaries of the physician, the salaries of the staff, uh, invoicing for medication, or any supplies that were purchased for that service. Therefore, uh, any delay in receiving reimbursement for those costs uh, from the insurer or patient can, can threaten the financial health of the hospital or physician entity because they've already incurred those costs, and so now they're just waiting to get you know, reimbursed for those costs. Uh, and another term, charges. 
Uh, a physician uh, or hospital will set prices for our services based on analysis, uh, typically of operating expenses and expected income. Uh, the price is set uh, by a hospital or physician for their services is referred to as the charges or billed charges. Uh, the charges by a hospital or physician represent uh, the retail price um, of that service and are usually compiled in a price listing known as the charge master. So the charge master holds a list of all your charges. And on the screen here are just some, some real basic components um, of a hospital charge master in terms of adding and some on the right hand of the screen, uh, just some examples of uh, payment codes and descriptions. But it's all housed within the charge master, uh, master of charges. Uh, the actual payment received from insurer, uh, net any discount is referred to as a net revenue. So you have your charges, uh, and then the actual payment that's received, so that difference is your, your discount, and um, after that discount, you have your net revenue. So regarding the payment, there are two broad categories of payment for healthcare services. And again, we're, we're really talking here in this presentation, overview, high level, um, there's a lot of great detail and complexity within a lot of these categories. Um, so I'm just gonna, again, talk a you know, broad description of what these um, types of payments are. Uh, so there's fee for service and there's capitation, which are the two broad categories. Each type of payment uh, may have different methods of structuring the payment to the provider. Um, and each variation in the way a provider is reimbursed creates different business incentives and risks, really, for both the provider and the health plans. Then as I go through these, you're, you're going to start to see what some of those uh, benefits and risks are. Uh, so the figure on the slide summarizes methods of payment within each category, and I'm going to go through in the next slides and talk a little bit about um, what some of these are and, and how uh, the payment is really determined um, for these. Uh, and uh, the, so uh, before I do it though, just uh, a, little, a little fun note, uh, the oldest and simplest um, fee-for-service reimbursement mechanism is the charge-based reimbursement. Uh, this payment system was widely used in the early days of commercial insurance. Uh, the hospital or physician is paid based on billed charges or uh, a percentage discount of charges. So 70% of the charges, um, for example. Uh, in circumstances where charge-based fees are used, health plans are now calling um, for the amount to be paid to be defined in a part of the contract known as the fee schedule. Uh, and for charge increases to be limited by contracted. So we're really seeing, um, you know, fee schedules used where based on that procedure, there's a fee, specific fee that is applied. Um, and also, you know, where hospitals and providers are getting, uh, just to recap, limited on the amount they can increase their prices. You know, you can't increase prices, say, I don't know, 2% just to throw something out there. So um, on that previous slide, the, let's talk a little bit about prospective payment system. Um, so this was really in response to the open-ended nature of healthcare payments through the 60s and the 70s. Remember, you know, that percent of charge and that cost-based reimbursement. Um, you know, insurers increased premiums until really the consumers began to call for insurers to, uh, to limit increase in payment uh, to providers. Uh, this led to the implementation of the prospective payment models um, to hospitals and physician. Uh, there are four main types of prospective payments commonly used in today's healthcare market. Uh, a payment based on a patient's diagnosis uh, is known as the diagnosis related group or diagnostic related group, DRGs. Um, and these are DRG payments. Uh, DRGs are widely used um, in payments to hospitals, uh, specifically inpatient services. Uh, a DRG is a classification um, of, I'm sorry, uh, a DRG is a classification of a disease to approximately 750 different DRG groups or categories. Uh, in an effort to simplify the 
payment structure for hospitals and physicians, a per procedure payment mechanism um, is preferable. And, and again, in the uh, online course, you'll learn a little bit more about these different um, relationships with DRGs. Uh, two per procedure payment approaches are used. Hospitals are paid on the ambulatory payment classification, or known as APCs, uh, which is similar to inpatient DRG in that the amount is based on a specific procedure or service provided to the patient. Um, so this is typically definitely see more in the outpatient setting in terms of the ambulatory side of things. Um, physicians similarly are paid on the resource-based value scale, or RBRVS. Uh, under RBRVS, the physician payment per procedure um, or service performed uh, varies based on the amount of resources, uh, usually time and effort needed by the physician. So your RBU or your RB, RBRVS um, is really based upon um, assessing that time and effort that the physician is applying for that procedure or that service. So each procedure and service is essentially assessed and that physician time and effort um, is given a value and that's how um, reimbursement or payment is, is provided to the physician. Uh, if a patient receives multiple procedures during one occasion uh, of service and a patient record is analyzed to determine the primary procedure rate, um, that was performed and that procedure paid at the full per procedure rate. Um, so now to talk a little bit about uh, another part of prospective payment system, a different you know payment model. Again, these are all different models in which um, um, reimbursement is done in payment. There's the per diem payment, um, which is a, a simpler method of prospective payment. Uh, and it's a per day payment system, which is used primarily for reimbursement to hospitals or long-term care facilities. Um, as the name implies, the health plan reimburses a facility a fixed amount per day uh, to care for a patient. Um, as with the pre, pre I mean, as with the per procedure method, the per diem payment is administratively easy for the health plan and provides a predictable payment rate uh, that is useful in setting competitive premium rates. So on the screen, you can see an example, you know, MSDRG003, um, number of cases 18,000, average length of stay 34 days, um, what's the average length of stay? So you would see your, your per day or per diem rate, which would be calculated by looking at your, your each day, essentially, this is an example. Um, of a per diem payment. So under um, the ACA uh, or the Affordable Care Act came two additional new payment um, systems. Um, the incentive for the hospital uh, is to limit services while incentive for the physician is to provide more services. Uh, the advent of value-based payment uh, is a step toward aligning the incentives of hospitals and physicians uh, in reducing the sources um, of this conflict where you have, you know, as I mentioned, the hospital's incentive is to limit services while the physician is to increase it. So it's really aligning um, all those um, conflicts. And a form of value-based payment is bundled payment in which the health plan pays a single prospective rate for all services provided by both the physician and the hospital, and the provider entity then um, equitably divides the payment amongst themselves. Um, so they get one payment for all the services, um, and then they separate it, um, you know, between um, each of the uh, people involved in the care. So um, as we saw in the graph earlier, we had um, fee for service and then capitation. So the um, capitation is the other common type of reimbursement. Uh, in many respects, capitation is the exact, uh, complete exact opposite of fee-for-service payment. Uh, capitation pays a fixed amount per person per month to a provider in advance as payment for all services necessary for the patient. Uh, so I'm just going to say that again. So per person per month to the provider in advance. So it's very different, as you can see, from those other payment models earlier where 
Um, it's a you know your your fee for service, your percent of charge payment, right? So you have the charges. Um, so you bill for your charges, and that's a percent of charge. Where this is well ahead of the time, one lump sum um, for the provider to determine what services are best. So very very different, which is why they are really um, exact opposites of one each other. Um, the capitation payment amount is normally expressed as a amount per member per month, which I mentioned earlier, or PMPM. So it's your PMPM. Uh, capitation is most common in relationships between primary care physicians uh, and managed care plans, such as health maintenance organizations uh, or HMOs. However, capitation is used also used for services from specialty physicians in some facilities. So it's used in, in other scenarios as well, not just primary care and managed care plans. Capitation is sometimes referred to as uh, a risk transfer mechanism where the cost of care to select uh, a group of patients is transferred from the health plan to the provider. Um, again, because the, the health plan is essentially providing one lump sum per member per month, and it's the responsibility of the provider entity to manage the care and, and essentially the costs associated with that. So it's a, it's a big transition. And this next slide, I think, really does a good job at showing um, the transition of risk. So generally, generally speaking, prospective payment method or capitation creates risk for physicians and hospitals. Um, and, and as we talked a little bit, I'm hoping you can kind of see those risks um, a little bit more. Uh, these methods also change some of the ways that a health plan would manage the risk of these healthcare plans. So. Um, not only does it create some risk depending on it, and now it sort of is, um, changes the way depending on um, what the structure is, um, how to manage the risk of the healthcare cost. Um, a summary of incentive and risk of the types of reimbursement is shown up here. Uh, as long as both parties have a solid understanding of the risks they undertake with prospective payment arrangements, uh, a business relationship based on this type of payment can be mutually beneficial. Uh, and yielding a reasonable income to both the health plan and provider. Um, so on this slide here, you can see, you know, cost based on the far left, capitation on the far right, um, and how it breaks out by providers, payers, consumers, employers. And it talks to a little bit about, you know, with cost based reimbursement, for example, payers have high financial risk. Whereas with capitation, there's low financial risk. Now remember, with capitation, it's a one fee per member per month. So the payer has a pretty good idea of what their financial costs are gonna be month to month based on the number of members. However, with cost-based reimbursement, a payer has less control of the cost of the, um, the provider. And so those financial risks are, are riskier in terms of what the cost will be. Um, um, similarly, consumers, um, for its cost based, there's a risk of over, -treat, uh, over treatment, right? So the more services the provider provides, the more reimbursement the provider is going to get with cost based reimbursement. Now, with capitation, it, as I mentioned, it's a one um, per member per month rate. Um, so there can be risk of under treatment because the less services the provider pr provides, the more profit the provider is going to. Make. So there's a balance um, and really understanding those risks um, with everyone involved is really important for um, providers and health plans um, as you look at these reimbursement and incentive strategies. So now we're going to talk a little bit about something that is near and dear to me and what I am completely fascinated about um, and what I really enjoy is the revenue cycle. Uh, the revenue cycle within um, you know, a healthcare setting is um, quite complex and it's um, many, many, many processes. Um, and this is really referred to as the billing and collection process in healthcare. Um, and it's usually described as the revenue cycle. Um, so the, health, the revenue cycle in healthcare can be broken into really three main categories or phases um, that cross between provider, health plan, insurances, um, and really involves everyone involved in the healthcare. Um, 
and then this diagram is just a really high level um, illustration in the diagram um, for this sake and for you know your online presentation um, it would go much more into detail but I'll talk to you a little bit about each of the activities on the next few slides on what's within each one of these uh, because within each phase there are several steps um, beginning with the activities prior to the patient even visiting so before the patient even shows up for the visit there's activities that happen within the revenue cycle um, there's activities during the patient visit so while the patients um, at the provider office or within the hospital there's um, activities being performed uh, and then there's activities that occur after the patient visit so after the patient leaves there's there's things and activities that a health um, organization, healthcare organization, needs to do in order um, to bill and collect, um, you know, the reimbursement required for those services. So let's talk a little bit of, about uh, the pre-service activities. Uh, so the pre-service activities are intended uh, to facilitate the gathering of information necessary uh, for the services the patient um, during the visit. Uh, so basically, you, you're pre-collecting information um, for, before the, for the visit um, that is needed for the billing and collecting of services after the visit. Uh, it's really important um, to pre-visit pre revenue cycle activities um, account for approximately 60% of all the information needed to serve the patient during the visit and bill for services. Um, is collected before the patient even arrives, uh, 60%. Uh, so it's essential that managers pay particular attention uh, to the accuracy of data gathered and processed at these early stages of the patient visit. Um, remember, 60% of the information is before the patient even um, um, comes for the visit. So let's talk a little bit about what pre-visit revenue cycle activities are. Uh, I'm sitting here talking about pre-service, I hadn't even touched on um, what they are. So uh, patient scheduling. So during the scheduling transaction, basic demographic information about the patient and his or her payment resources is collected. Um, this data should be recorded as part of um, an account, um, a patient account, when the visit is scheduled. Um, so essentially you're creating a scheduled patient account with some um, demographic information um, with the patient. Um, since data on the patient's payment resources is collected uh, when the visit is scheduled, the provider can then contact the patient's health uh, plan and complete um, the eligibility verification, which is uh, an essential step within the pre-services. You're essentially uh, verifying that the patient uh, is eligible for the health benefits um, within the health plan. So um, just to talk back a little bit, so you schedule the patient, you gather basic um, information, demographic information, um, some basic information on the health insurance and plan, um, and then the next step is well, to verify that um, patient has um, is eligible for the health benefits and health plan um, available and provided. The eligibility verification step can also advise the provider um, of any out-of-pockets amount. So we talked a little bit earlier about those out-of-pockets, you know, your co-payments, co-insurance, deductible. So this verification step will also um, provide those out-of-pocket information, which when it comes to registration, um, registering at the time of service when the patient arrives, if the patient or um, it can be payable in accordance with their contract and the health plan. Well, uh, and the provider should collect that amount at the time um, of the service. Uh, so this is known as the point of service collection. Again, verify that insurance, you pre-certify that they have those, you identify any co-payments, um, the amount, so when the patient comes and registers, you then point of service collection and collect that. Uh, and some of those exit primary tests uh, or your 100, 150 um, for the ED. Hopefully you're not going to the ED too often um, to know what that co-payment amount is. So, uh, uh, and it's important, I should know, it's very important uh, um, to collect it. Far more difficult to collect these amounts from the patient. 
after the service has been rendered. It's essential to make sure patient. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, during the patient visit. So once the patient is registered, um, again, you remember you had verified, you uh, pre you did all, all those pre um, within the revenue set. Um, we prepared for documenting the services provided to the patient, um, right? So we all know the, the, the EMR, your electronic medical record paper, you know, we need to have that medical record available um, once registered to document. Um, and data from the medical record is used to support any additional uh, utilization review requirements of the health it says certification of additional days or demonstration of the need for additional surgical procedure. Um, at this time, documenting services in the medical record may assist staff in completing charge capture. So we talked a little bit about charge master and charge capture, uh, where the individual items making up the total charges on a patient account are compiled. Um, so I'm sitting here talking and I haven't um, showed any of you the bullet points. So we talked a little bit about uh, providing care to the patient, needing that medical record, um, having that source documentation uh, to document that um, for the care to the patient. We talked a little bit about the, how that can be helpful in the utilization review. Uh, again, that's you know um, authorizing or, or um, getting approved, you know, certain surgical procedures or, or days needed for an inpatient stay. Um, and a lot of this is, can be used for charge capture. Um, you know, the data collected um, is really um, imperative for charge capture. You know, for a great example, a nurse um, does a venipuncture or, um, you know, needs to give blood or um, the provider does a procedure, they document that during the visit, and a lot of times that can capture, or in some instances automate, your, your charge capture your processes. Or if a supply is used, um, you capture that supply um, charge as well. So, it, um, so at the, ideally, you would capture your charges um, before discharge, um, before the visit ends, um, and the discharge um, is sort of the discharge of the patient. The patient is getting discharged either home or they're getting discharged to another facility, um, but essentially they're leaving um, the facility. Um, and so it's really important that you capture a lot of this information above before a patient is discharged. Um, so that's activities during the patient visit. So once the patient has been discharged from the physician or the hospital care, uh, the process really goes from gathering data uh, to really then using the data um, compiled, which is kind of um, interesting, right? So we did that 60% hopefully of that data collected in the pre-service. Then during the visit, you have that a really other 40%, you have the documentation, um, you have the sort of authorizations from that utilization review process I talked about. So now you have you know, all of this data to base, to compile um, the claim, a claim for reimbursement. And you got those charges as well um, needed for the claim. So the time between uh, discharge, uh, the time, I'm sorry, the time between the discharge of a patient and a submission of the claim to a health plan is known as, known as your discharge but not final build, or DNFB, kind of a neat name, right? Discharged, but the claim is not final bill. Um, you gotta love healthcare acronyms. So uh, this is really known as DNFB, um, and you'll hear that said a lot. DNFB, DNFB. Um, so ideally, during this time, the medical record should be completed at the time of discharge, or as quickly as possible thereafter, uh, depending on the nature of the service provided to the patient. Um, and the review of all documentation uh, contained in the medical record to prepare a final summary of care provided to the patient uh, for use in the billing process. Uh, so preparation of this document known as the discharge summary is currently um, a point of delay in timely completing um, you know, the process of um, the discharge. But once complete, uh, the medical record is analyzed by a professional trained um, in assigning of procedure and diagnosis codes 
to a patient's record to classify the services provided and for use in billing. Uh, and this process is known as uh, coding. Um, the coding process analyzes the medical record uh, to assign uh, that describes the diagnosis, or I'm sorry, codes that describe the diagnoses of the patient's condition and the procedures performed during the visit. Um, so again, all that documentation um, provided during the visit uh, is essentially analyzed, the medical records analyzed and coded. Um, and those codes are based on um, diagnoses and procedures. So the billing step entails basically combining these charges, these diagnoses, these procedure data from the medical record along with the demographic and payment information into a formal claim for reimbursement to be sent to the health plan. Um, so all those activities that we've discussed is all getting us ready for the bill and compiling all those charges and codes. So once the claim is submitted to the health plan, uh, a series of steps are required by the health plan uh, in order to process the claim for payment um, to the provider, uh, collectively referred to as claim adjudication. Uh, upon receipt of the claim, the health plan um, will record the, um, the claim in its inventory of claims. The health plan will be um, basically known as claim logging. So the insurers logging all that claim information um, it is customary with the use of electronic billing for the health plan to send electronic acknowledgement of the claim to the provider. Um, as the claim is being adjudicated, the first step is to verify the patient was eligible for coverage by the health plan on the date the service um, recorded on the claim. Uh, this is important because the patient's eligibility um, can actually change um, and the record keeping by the health plan uh, may lag behind the actual transaction that occurred. Um, so once the claim has been determined to be on behalf of the patient who is eligible for coverage, it is then screened for accuracy uh, and the description of services covered by the contract between the patient and the health plan. So um, as you can see, you know, the, the hospital collects all this billing information, they code it, they get these codes, they get this claim, they send it to the health plan, and you, you're seeing already what the, all the stuff the health plan does, right? It logs the claim, it checks eligibility to make sure that the patient actually has that coverage um, being billed for. Um, so after determining that that coverage, the adjudication process moves into calculating the payment due. Uh, and the payment amount is governed by the agreement or the contract contract between the provider and the health plan. Um, um, so based on whatever those contract criteria are, what was negotiated is how that payment will then be provided. And some of those payments we talked about, you know, we talked a little bit about that percent of charge. We talked about those DRG payments or per diem rates. Um, so the health plan and the contract will outline what that arrangement is. Uh, so once the payment amount has been determined, the remittance, um, the remittance is prepared and queued for release on a specified future date. Uh, normally, the payment is made through electronic funds transferred to the bank of the physician or the, um, the hospital. Um, when the payment is sent, something called the 835 record. Um, remittance advice is also sent. So your remittance or your 835 record remittance is sent to the provider. And essentially, I like to think of a remittance as kind of like a receipt. Uh, you're getting your, your receipt of, you know, what was covered, what wasn't covered, um, and, and whatnot. Continue with uh, the post-patient um, visit. Um, so once the claim um, sort of goes through that process, it's something known as a clean claim. Um, most states in the federal government have requirements for health plans to pay a clean claim within a specif specified amount um, of time after they receive it. However, if a physician or hospital does not send a clean claim, uh, payment will be delayed while the health plan seeks additional information. 
Um, in such a circumstance, it is more likely that the claim will be denied. It's um, not a clean claim. Well, some denials uh, are unavoidable, um, such as, you know, if the patient came and provided false information or they didn't give accurate information at the time of services, um, and you get denied for, you know, wrong coverage, you know, that's unavoidable. You know, you, you received false information. Uh, most denials are a result of an error uh, in an earlier um, phase of this process. So I kind of mentioned, you know, that verification, that insurance process. Many denials are really in the early stages. Uh, and avoiding errors before a claim is submitted eliminates or it can definitely reduce um, delays in payment to the health plan. So we talked a little bit about that AR, <clears throat> your accounts receivables. So you can kind of see how a clean claim you know, will improve payment much faster and really reduce that AR, that, that average days um, to payment. So a best practice in denial management, um, so to avoid these denials, is to create a log of all denials received um, and determine uh, trends and look for underlying causes of those denials, right? So you're gonna, you know, track trend and, and root cause why you're getting denials improve that clean claim rate, reduce your AR. Um, so you kind of see how all of this is tying together within the revenue cycle and revenue management. Uh, so payment posting. So once uh, you do get payment, uh, payment posting is, is accomplished through electronic billing and electronic fund transfer. Uh, it's usually a straightforward process where the total payment on a remittance is advice is compared to the total payment posted. Um, so once the total payment received from the health plan and patient equal the amount specified in the contract with the health plan, the hospital or physician can close the account. So again, that's, you know, based on the contract, the, the payment equals what we actually received and matches the contract, we just close the account. The account's closed, right? We provided the service, we rendered those services, uh, we charged for those services, we built for those services, we got reimbursed for those services. Um, so then you have the account closure. So we talked a little about revenue cycle um, and the AR and payment and reimbursement and, and sort of that um, reimbursement amount, that cash. So it's always critical to pay attention to um, the amount of cash on hand um, in the use of cash while provider awaits reimbursement for services. Uh, so the difference between current assets, which is your cash, your receivables, uh, your inventory, and current liabilities, so you have your assets, your liabilities, such as you know your salaries payable, you know what salaries are due, um, accounts payables, what bills do you have coming up that are due, is referred to as working capital. Uh, so this is your capital, essentially, um, to manage, um, well, I'm sorry, essentially working capital entails collecting receivables uh, as quickly as possible while making payments for salaries and other expenses on the day due um, and not before. So, so we talked a little bit about that revenue stream and we have a little bit of expenses. So it's really, you know, um, building that working capital. So a common metric, common metric for monitoring inventory levels is the days in inventory ratio. Uh, hospitals use this ratio frequently um, as do large physician clinics. Uh, it may not be relevant to small physician offices or health plans that um, maintain a pretty small, you know, minimum inventory of things. Uh, days in payables is a ratio, um, is also um, an important tool that's used, uh, the health plan has a large amount of payable on hand in terms of claims awaiting adjudication. Uh, health plan managers must be sure that they uh, are timing paying invoices presented uh, for payments. Uh, this is equally true for a physician clinic or hospital purchasing supplies uh, on trade credit. A timely payment are, are central to maintain access to trade credit, which allows the hospital or clinic to finance supplies used um, to provide care, right? So you need to have these um, 
this access and this um, infra cash really needed to basically finance supplies, uh, um, care as a organization as a healthcare um, provider. So short-term sources of financing um, entails different forms of debt. Um, the most common form of short-term debt in a healthcare organization is accounts payable. Uh, accounts payable are a form um, of trade credit um, where a supplier delivers goods to a buyer but delays collecting on those supplies for a short time, uh, usually about 30 days. Uh, this delay in payment for supply is a form of debt that can free up cash or other um, uses such as payment of salaries. Some businesses acquire additional short-term debt through a line of credit. So think of like a loan uh, with their bank. A line of credit is like a credit card um, through which the organization can draw funds as needed to meet immediate cash needs. So it's really, my loan was a bad example, but it's really short-term um, credit, like a credit card. Um, Long-term debt though uh, is almost always secured um, with some asset of a business as collected for the debt. Um, the, this debt is usually in the form of a mortgage, uh, so there's my loan example, just in the rental category, or bond um, issue. A longer-term rental agreement is referred to as a lease. Um, a lease may be structured as either an operating lease or a capital lease. Uh, in an operating lease, uh, it's essentially a long-term rental of uh, facilities or equipment. Um, a capital lease is similar in many respects to a mortgage in that the lease E, sorry, excuse me, makes a fixed monthly payment to the lesser for the use of the asset. I'm sorry, leaser for the use of the asset. Um, so we've talked, um, you know, we, you know, we, it went to a lot there in terms of a high level of you know your capital, your revenue cycle. Um, we hit on you know your out of pocket um, expenses for patients. We talked a little about the different payments. You know your your fee schedules, your prospective payment systems, your DRGs, um, co-payments, deductibles. Uh, we talked a little about. Um, the revenue cycle and really high level revenue cycle in terms of your pre-service activities. Um, we talked uh, a lot about um, the during the visit activities, post visit activities. Uh, now, as you go into the online training modules, uh, it gets into a lot more detail about the revenue cycle and you know and really how to manage all of these financial um, resources uh, within the healthcare um, industry. So don't forget to check out uh, your local HFMA chapter website to take a, a quick quiz survey on what you've learned. Um, additionally, uh, for those HFMA members out there, make sure to really get credit for taking this, um, going to this training by taking uh, the quiz survey, which again can be found on your local HFMA chapter website. Um, again, I uh, thank you all for your time and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, course six of um, the final uh, training module, um, a final course within our module one for the, the business of healthcare. So thank you again.